Well, today I'd like to welcome to the show uh, a researcher and explorer, another one of those uh, modern day Indiana Jones guys living the dream. And uh, coincidentally, he's even got the last name Jones, Andrew Jones. Andrew, how you doing, man? Thanks for coming on. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm doing great. And yes, I guess you could say I'm living the dream. It's hard work, but uh, I'm enjoying what I'm doing right now and thanking God for being a part of this. Well, uh, give us a little background. Tell us uh, who, who Andrew Jones is. And Okay, well, I am just right away. I'm not an archaeologist. Uh, one time, uh, the Turkish news made that mistake, and some people got after me. Said, You're not an archaeologist. <laughs> I did not write that PR piece. <laughs> but anyways, um, I'm a researcher, so I'm just really in interested in the biblical history and archaeology in general. I've been on a, a number of digs in Israel and in Jerusalem. And uh, what got me started in researching for Noah's Ark and just interested in this topic and even uh, like Mount Sinai and the Exodus route was Ron Wyatt, uh, a controversial uh, biblical explorer from Tennessee. And when I was a, a middle school uh, kid, uh, I heard about him. He came out to Northern California and I was able to uh, get his book right after that meeting. And we actually arranged for him to come out a couple times to the Sacramento area. And so I was able to meet him. And then in college, I made my first trip out here to Eastern Turkey, where I'm based right now. And so I've been uh, studying these sites for the last um, uh, 30 years, I guess you could say. And uh, we got our first trip to Saudi Arabia with a business invite from a Saudi prince. And we've been studying the Exodus and the real Mount Sinai there. And then here in Turkey, we've been documenting and researching this boat formation that appeared in the, uh, the, the, the press back in the 1950s and 60s. And that's how Ron got interested. And then I heard about it from Ron. And so here I am in Eastern Turkey doing this research and uh, leading tours. And so I'm just really excited to be uh, uh, have a small part of this. So you're actually getting to uh, give tours and stuff of these sites that Ron White ha had discovered, the, the Red Sea Crossing and, and the Mount Sinai and all that. that that's awesome. Yeah, it was not planned. Uh, basically, I started making a ton of trips on my own because I just wanted to go check the sites out for myself, you know, not want to take one man's word at it or his friend's word. So I started coming out here with other friends. And then soon uh, people started asking me to give presentation at churches and home meetings and online uh, and then some, you know, news uh reports too but uh right after that uh then people started asking if they could join me on my trips so then i started making it more official and having a you know tours set up but uh yeah people are very interested in these sites and i'm happy to show them what i know well uh i guess uh what let us know what have you been up to here recently i know like you are not right now at the dupinar site uh what are you looking at doing right now well, we just finished a couple tours. Uh, we also hosted a Russian American film crew out here for a Christian ministry out of Moscow. And they've done a, a, a really big series over here, 10 days filming. And so we're helping them out. So it's more like spreading the word about the sites and helping people understand, you know, why we think this is the best location for Noah's Ark. In regard to the actual research, uh, last of fall, um, we had a, a, a grand opening for the rededication of the visitor center that was built overlooking the site. And then this year, actually the Turks announced that they're gonna even rebuild that visitor center and make a brand new building um, with the help of a local businessman. And so we're super excited to be a part of that project too. Um, but right after our dedication ceremony, um, the Turks announced that they will start their own project of doing research to two Turkish universities, one local and one in Istanbul. And so we are uh, helping in a small way, but also just documenting what they will be doing and sharing it with the world. And so uh, this summer, I think they will start with their some of their survey work. Now, the year before, last year in 2021, the governor's office did do um, official scans. Uh, and then before that, in uh, 2019, uh, we did our own scans uh, with permission from the local government. And so... Uh, you know, then before that, 2014, I was here helping to film some of the early scans uh, that this guy from New Zealand, John Larson, did um, that uh, kind of pushed it into the news. 
uh, some of the new technology with ERT, which uses electricity. And so all this uh, surveying and scanning has generated a lot of interest and news and has gotten the Turkish government and the local universities interested in doing their own research. And so we're just happy that they're finally, you know, paying attention to the site because most of the time it's just been sitting there with, you know, there's tourists coming over there. Well, I know Ron White, I read that book that you were talking about that you had bought and they found, you know, I think it was like 1960, that Turkish army captain was looking at aerial footage and seeing this boat shape. And uh, it was, you know, a few years later, it was like, I think it was like September 1960, it came out in uh, an article. And that's what drew Ron to it, but he didn't even make it out there until the, I think it was 1977. Was that correct? Around that time? That's correct. Yes. Yeah, that article, uh, what happened, uh, this Turkish army captain who was in the cartography mapping division of the army, he was studying all these photographs that their pilots had taken of this region, because this was on the border with Iran and also the Soviet Union at the time. And he noticed this boat formation. In fact, it was September 11, uh, 1959, that he discovered it. And then it hit the news a week later. And the first photographs that the Turkish military actually released this photograph, um, it was published in October of that same year. And that generated a lot of interest in America. So we had a, a couple of Christian groups that got together and they came out here with Cap Captain Durupinar, the guy who discovered the boat. Um, and them in the Turkish army, they came out here in June of 1960. And one of the guys on that trip wrote up the article in Life magazine that was published on September 5th, 1960. And that's when Ron Wyatt saw it and he got really interested, but he didn't know who was involved in the trip until the 1970s when a book by one of the participants called Arc File by Rennie Norberg and was published and it listed everyone involved. And so he's able to contact these people and based on information from the, the uh, participants, he was able to go out here with his sons in uh, 1977. Uh, they briefly saw everything, uh, but it got him really interested. And then he came out two years later in 79 and started his own research throughout you know the 80s and up until the 90s now explain to those that's not familiar because like anybody that's familiar with the the biblical narrative we we know that the the boat come to rest on mount ararat well this is actually like 20 25 miles south of mount ararat Can yeah there's a misunderstanding uh, yes. or whatever well, there's a misunderstanding of the text because uh, the text actually says mountains of Ararat, uh, plural. And Ararat, the English word in the King James Version of the Bible, that word comes from the name of an ancient kingdom that used to cover this area called Urartu. And this, so the biblical text is actually saying that the ark landed in the mountains of the kingdom of Urartu. And so that's kind of like today saying, the ark landed in the mountains of Colorado or the mountains of Canada, a very generic, I mean, it's a region and this was a mountainous kingdom, but it's not uh, Moses who wrote the book of Genesis, I believe. Uh, he's not specifically saying a specific mountain. He's just saying, hey, Noah's ark landed in the mountains of this ancient kingdom. And we are in fact, yes, about 15, 17 miles south of across the valley uh, from the big giant peak that today is called Mount Ararat, uh, but that name for that mountain was not given until much later. Uh, so just like anything traditional, uh, like you have the traditional Mount Sinai, you have these names that later on people have attached to different locations, but probably not biblical. So uh, this mountain that you see across from the Durupanar site where this boat formation's at, uh, it's a stratovolcano and most create, in fact, I don't know of any, I think I should say all creation scientists who are geologists would say that this is a post-flood volcano, meaning that the mountain erupted and formed after the flood. And so, which means the ark did not even land up there. And if it did land, it would have been destroyed because it's a, a volcano with the last eruption in 1842 or 41, um, which blew out the north side. So you have this you know, somewhat active volcano that's forming this mountain and you had people, uh, you know, since the Middle Ages up until in the 80s, probably. And in fact, even today, there are a couple of groups that still think the Ark is up there on the outside edge of this you know, volcano, which is impossible because of the, the mountain wasn't even around during the flood. Uh, but the site that Ron uh, and these other people have been interested in, and ourselves too, um, is just south of there. It's in a, the smaller mountains, about 8,000 feet high, some of the peaks on the range that we're at. 
Um, Mount Ararat is the tallest mountain of Turkey. It's like 16,000 some feet. Uh, just like Mount Shasta or I don't know what Mount Rainier in Washington. But this stratovolcano um, is pretty high. And based on just the availability of the water that's around today, um, just like you know, Mount Everest is so high, you're not gonna have the water cover these massive peaks. Uh, so these mountains were formed after the flood. Um, but uh, the, the site we're, look at, we're located at um, and been studying, it's 6,500 feet elevation on these lower mountains, but still within the biblical mountains of Ararat. Which I know modern science, you know, is constantly, you know, growing and, and we're getting new ideas and new perspectives. But, and don't quote me, I mean, you probably know better than I do, but I think I remember in a documentary or, or a video or something of Ron's and he was talking about how he believes that it had landed up there in those higher mountains, but there's like mud flow rings and, and looks like maybe the boat had slid down the mountain, like with some kind of lava flow or mud flow. And then like there, he seen some kind of look like an indention or crack in the hole of the ship or the, or the formation that maybe that when it hit, it, it snapped or buckled. Because I know when you look at it, just for me, layman, you know, just looking, you can actually see what looks like mud flow or lava flow lines going down into that valley. Yeah, the location it's at right now is not at the very summit of these low mountains. Um, so if you go up about a mile, you'll hit the Iranian-Turkish border. Um, and the, the elevation there is about 8, 7,500, 8,000 feet. Um, and so if you look at it, satellite images, like you're talking about, like a Google Earth, uh, you'll see that there's this mud flow. Um, they actually technically call it the earth flow, but this this movement of the land that's coming down the mountainside and the, this boat formation is stuck in the middle of it at the 6,500 foot level. So in Ron's belief, and it makes total sense, as the flood waters were reciting, uh, receding, the, uh, the ark landed much further up near the summit of these low mountains. And then Later on, we, we don't know when, they came down, the ark um, moved down to where it's at right now. And so you have this like shipwreck on the side of a mountain at the 6,500 foot level. I know there was some controversy with the, the scans and stuff that they had done. I've I seen the, you know, the, the reprints and stuff in the book of the scans, and you can see that this boat formation with, with three tiers, and then they even done uh, like some metal detection, like ever so many, you know, feet or whatever. It was almost, you know, like in a pattern, like metal detections, like maybe it was held together by metal rivets and stuff like that. And I know that some guys later, that even the people that was on his team that was saying, yes, this is, you know, legit, everything's good, like all of a sudden changed their mind and they recanted yeah. and said, no, it wasn't right. And can you elaborate on that? Yeah. So Ron and no one else has ever done a full scale excavation of this site. Um, and we've even asked the Turks today, like, you know, we're pushing for excavations, but they're scared. Uh, they have different reasons why. Um, and I think one reason was that uh, it would destroy these, this fragile boat formation. If you do a, uh, a typical top-down uh, excavation, like a big square, like five meter by five meter, you have this hole, and everyone comes to take a picture of the boat formation. So when you destroy the, the, the boat shape, you know, ex, uh, you know, archaeology is a destructive science. Whatever you remove, it's gone for good. Um, so what we're pushing them to do is like, okay, well, maybe uh, you can do core drilling and get samples from deep inside the formation. Um, and they're even talking about maybe tunneling in from the side, like the eastern side that's furthest away from the visitor center, uh, which is not really a, a typical way you do, you know, because you want to see the, the stratigraphy when you do an excavation. So you're going from the side in, it might not work. But anyways, these are some of the reasons why they've told us that oh, we don't want to excavate. Um, re regards to the scan, so since no one has excavated, everyone's been focused in on, well, what's below the ground that's forming the shape? And so they're using different technologies, whether Ron first started with metal detectors, um, and then they went on to the kind of the first use of GPR, ground penetrating radar, which shoots this uh, frequency into the ground, and then the recorder with the frequency bouncing back off different material, whether it's rock or petrified wood or dirt, you know, it's recorded onto, um, uh, you know, back then it was a piece of paper, and now it's recorded onto a, a hard drive, and then they can analy analyze it with uh, software. 
And so uh, back in the 80s, they had GPR and they did metal detector scans. Um, and that was it. Uh, and so some of the original members, and I think the, the one main one would be John Baumgartner. Dr. Baumgartner is a creationist, so he believes in the biblical account. But uh, so early on, he was a supporter of the site. And he had teamed up with Dr. Saleh Barak Tutan, who's a local uh, professor of geology, who's retired now, he's still alive. And he, as a geologist um, and as a Muslim, he believes in the biblical account. Um, but he um, is a geologist, while Dr. John Bachner was a geophysicist. And so they did these scans, and just based on the same data set, the scans, and they actually did some limited core drilling. I think they did four or five cores. But according to the Turkish scientist, Dr. Saleh Brak Tutan, they got bad data. The machine was not correct. The water was damaging the cores. It was the right dry um, coring machine to preserve the samples they wanted to get out. And so he says there's nothing there um, that uh, you can use against it being Noah's Ark. He says the data still supports in his mind as being a man-made object. So this is the Turkish geologist. And he's been studying this site the longest than anyone. He started in 1985. And up to this day, we met with him last October. He was at the site taking samples. And he still believed it was a man-made object. Um, then you have Dr. John Bob Gardner, the American uh, geophysicist, who, yes, is a creationist. But um, he changed his mind with the same data. So they both collected the same data. They're part of the same team. One guy goes home and a year or two later changes his mind about it with no new data. The Turkish geologist um, who's been studying this site you know, since 85 has kept you know, the same opinion that it is a man-made object. And so I, um, for me, I'm interested because if you have a geologist, especially someone who, um, you know, he's not an atheist, but he's not a, a Christian. And he's saying, this is a man-made object. And here's, and he's explaining why. Um, and then you have someone else who changes their mind and doesn't give you a good reason. I, I'd rather go with the guy who's been studying it the longest and who has that background in geology. And so, you know, from that perspective, that's kind of where the controversy started. We had some of these original people, you know, mainly one guy who changed his mind. And so I don't even know if John Baumgartner is looking for Noah's Ark anymore. Uh, most people aren't. Um, but uh, like the group he's associated with, ICR, I don't know if he does work with Answers in Genesis also, but those are some of the two biggest creation research groups in America, you know, they, they don't believe the drop in our site is Noah's Ark. But what's re really interesting, you know, in the 80s, the, all these groups were looking for Noah's Ark on Mount Ararat. Uh, now they've changed their tune and they're looking everywhere else. And they've written articles on their website stating why Mount Ararat cannot be the location for the landing of Noah's Ark. And so that's a big change because before it was always everyone, you know, fundraising for these big trips up the mountain. And now suddenly they're not doing that anymore. They're saying, well, you know, this mountain where we thought was not, Noah's Ark was up there is no longer there. Um, and so, um, you know, we, you, you still have a small number of people interested in this boat formation. And so that's, you know, we're focusing on that. We believe the evidence, even if you uh, look at the newer scans done, if you look at that, uh, even without excavations, I, we believe the scans are showing that there's something there. And so uh, we're not going to um, give up until either the Turks do a professional core drilling survey and pull out a bunch of samples at different you know, depths, or if they ex you know, excavate the whole site. And that's one thing I've always wondered, because it was just like, for me, you know, for something to form naturally, and it looks identical to a boat in the middle of dry land, no water around anywhere, so it ain't like it's just a, you know, couple yards away from you know an ocean or a lake that some guys were building it and going to drag it a short ways or something like that but then even the measurements you know i loved how ron laid that out in his book he said you know that uh moses was an egyptian he was raised and schooled in the egyptian way so if he you know measured it was going to be with the egyptian cubit and that the uh the measurements that we get in Genesis with the, if you use the Egyptian cubit comes out to, I think it's like 515 feet, give or take. Yeah. And this site is just a little over 500 feet in length. I mean, the, even the, the shape and the, the measurements add up to the biblical account. 
Yeah, what a coincidence. I mean, yeah. here you have in the mountains of Ararat, where the Bible says you're going to find Noah's Ark, you have this boat shape. Uh, there's no water around. You find fossils, by the way, all through that those mountain ranges there. I was just up there with um, a tour group, and we found sand dollars, um, uh, shallow water seashells. Um, so, the, you know, the evolutionists will say this was called the Tetra Sea, a shallow water sea back you know, billions of years ago, whatever. Um, but, you know, from creations uh, in a flood, uh, global flood standpoint, we believe that the earth has totally changed and that this land was uplifted uh, now in the mountain range. But you're finding these fossils. In fact, some of the seashells have not even been fossilized yet. They're turned to stone. They're still the original shell. And so in this mountain range with this evidence, you're finding a boat formation that's exactly 300 cubits long, as Moses wrote. And what a coincidence. Um, and in regards to the, what, like, which cubit did he use, the shorter Hebrew cubit or the royal Egyptian or you know, the, even the Hebrews later on, the Jews, they had a longer cubit that was the same size as the royal Egyptian cubit. But if you look at um, any historical document uh, that's talking about measurements in the ancient world, they all agree that during this time period, the royal Egyptian cubit, which was about 20.6 inches or so, um, that was the standard of measurement. It's like today outside the US, uh, the metric system is a standard of measurement. And in any scientific literature, you're gonna use a metric system, this global measuring system. And back then they had the Egyptian royal cubit. Uh, if you go to the uh, different museums in Egypt, you'll actually find cubit rods and they actually had these standard uh, measurements. And it's exactly, if you take it 300 of those and convert it then to the English system, like we have, we have 515 feet. It's exactly the length of this boat. Uh, one of my tours a couple of years ago, we actually had a guy who, come out, who came out here from Texas. He brought a long measuring tape and we measured the thing on the ground. So you had the hills and such from inside the boat, but it was actually from the tip to the, you know, you can say from the bow to the stern or whatever, uh, from the top to the bottom, it was 515 feet long. Uh, so this is not something like, uh, this is not a rough estimate. This is not a made up thing by Ron Wyatt or something. Uh, you have this boat formations that are exactly the, the, um, the size of Noah's Ark. Oh, and the one other thing, um, you talk about a boat formation, because some people will say, well, you can find these all over the area, um, like on Mount Ararat. And they say it's the result of, um, fluid dynamics, you know, so like mud or lava going down the side of a mountain and forming a boat shaped object. Uh, the biggest problem with that is, uh, is that they don't realize unless, you know, they've come out here themselves, people don't realize what, which end of that boat is actually the upper end. And if they did, they would then know that the top pointed end, which is uphill, uh, is, would be backwards. So what I'm trying to say is that as the mud, if this is a uh, say a natural formation if mud was coming down and hit a rock and formed uh, uh, like a bulb object or it, like it would shave the near end first hard and harder right? yeah well that pointed in based on typical fluid dynamics it would actually form that pointed in downhill so as it's going around it like what you look at a stream water or a mud flow you'll see that happen um and this is the opposite you have the pointed in uphill and the rounded in downhill so you can't say that, hey, the, uh, a rock in the middle of this earth flow or mud flow created this object. So then the question is, well, what created it? And it was kind of funny because I saw this geologist write an article. Um, it was a Turkish geologist. And his claim was, ah, well, this was formed over millions of years by a glacier. But the actual inside of this formation is a solid piece of rock that came down from above, higher up on the mountain, slid down. And then uh, over millions of years, the glacier kind of formed more of this formation. Um, he's kind of saying, um, but using evolutionary terms, he's kind of saying what well, we're uh, theorizing that a fossilized boat, which is a rock, uh, you know, whatever's left of it down below, um, the hull or different decks maybe, came from above, you know, moved down and is stuck where it's at right now. And, but he was claiming his article, it's a solid piece of rock and he said, oh, we need to, I think this was written in 2010 or so, maybe a little earlier. But he said, well, we need to get uh, core drilling done or geophysical surveys. So here's a guy who, probably, I don't know if he even been out to the site, but he's saying we need to do the, the, t the type of things that actually have been done now. And what these surveys have shown from 2014, 2019, and 2021, these most recent surveys, that what's below the ground is not a solid piece of rock. And so that guy's whole article is just shattered. You know, his theory that this is a solid rock that came down from above 
what uh, we were saying that there's there are things um, right below, like what you see above ground is this earthen boat formation. But what's keeping it there? That's what everyone is, you know, is it Noah's Ark or what? It, what is it? And so the scans are showing that there are right angles, there are parallel lines, there are layers. Yeah, there's three That's tiers. All, yeah, and it's all within the, the uh, parameter of that, uh, what you see above ground, the boat formation. It's not out in the mud flow or someplace else. In fact, the 2021 Turkish team that did the most recent survey, they focused on ERT, which is, again, using electricity uh, to map out the you know the resistive nature of what's below the ground, and then the software can you know, form a 3D model. And what they found was, and they did 39 scans, so they did the most, even more than the 2014 scans, and they focused not just in the boat, but outside into the mud flow, into the earth flow. They wanted to see, is this boat formation you see above ground unique, or is it just part of the natural rubble you see you know, on this mountainside? And what they found was that, and they haven't released the results yet, we're just trying, we keep pushing them, hey, can we do an interview and can we get this released? You can but release them here. This, <laughs> yeah, and we don't even have access to the data, but uh, you know, we went to the guy's office and had a private meeting. And he said no recordings. So we, he gave us an update and showed us on his phone, <laughs> little screen, uh, some of the results. And he was saying that there was something unique below the ground that's just right there, um, inside that boat formation that's not part of the surrounding mud flow. Uh, and so again, uh, if you're not gonna, if people are gonna say, ah, this is not Noah's Ark, then what is it? So I'm interested in trying to, you know, get to the bottom of it, so to speak, you know, dig down or cord down. Uh, if any of these scientists could do that and show us the results, that will settle it. Uh, so for now, since that has not been done, and we have, I think, a great amount of data that points to it being at least a man-made object in the shape of a ship, uh, to me, it's the best location for Noah's Ark. Are you a God-fearing, patriotic American or someone that just enjoys good coffee? I encourage you guys to check out the sponsor of the show, Kevlar Joe's Coffee Company. Veteran owned, family man of God, and you're buying these big name coffee brands, you don't know where your money's going and what it's going to support. Support a small business owner and a hard nosed veteran. And that's the thing I was saying earlier is like, you know, atheists and people that, that don't want to believe it's, and they always want to talk about our faith. Well, to believe what you believe, your faith is a lot stronger than ours. I mean, look at the, the the hoops that you have to jump through to come to a conclusion that you don't want it to be. You know, you were talking about these guys coming up with all these different theories, you know, and I even heard you say, well, it was we're finding the fossils here because it was, uh, you know, you said uh, uh, a low-level sea. Yeah, you know, low level sea. Well, shallow why, sea. And why need yeah. that big boat for that little shallow sea? You know, and these are the yeah, guys that the years and time, yeah. you know, time is the answer for everything. Billions and billions of years and, you know, time fixes everything, you know, and these are the same people that say all of this came from nothing. Yeah, correct. Uh, you know, you, you'll even have, though, on the religious side, those who just don't want to believe. Uh, look at the time of Christ, uh, the Pharisees. Christ told, told them, you know, even if a dead person was raised from the grave, you would not believe. And he would be something physical showing his power that he's the son of God. And in fact, a dead person was raised and they tried to kill Lazarus, you know, <laughs> the Bible says. So uh, if someone doesn't want to believe, they're not going to believe. Now, I, no, I don't think, you know, whether someone believes this is Noah's Ark or not is a salvational issue. Yeah. Um, but uh, I think it's evident, especially if, if it is Noah's Ark, it is evidence for those who need that proof, like doubting Thomas who wanted to physically see the nail prints the uh, in Christ's hand after he was resurrected. He, you know, uh, Christ, you know, told him, you know, those who believe without seeing, you know, the blessing are they. But, but he was still willing to give the proof to uh, Thomas, even though he doubted. And I, there are people today, because God does not want anyone to perish. There are people today who needs that physical proof. Uh, and they don't have this. I don't think this is for the Christian world. Uh, you know, if they believe that the flood happened by faith, like Hebrews uh, 11 says, you know, then it happened. I don't need to go find Noah's Ark. But there are those out there who aren't Christians, atheists, or other religions who do need physical proof. And I think that's why God um, has preserved these artifacts, whether it's this site or other things in biblical archaeology that, that do prove the Bible correct. 
well, maybe we just need to start uh, getting our prayer life in order. I, I remember reading in uh, Ron White's book, he said that in 77 when he seen it, he wanted to dig and do all these excavations and stuff, and the Turkish government kept denying him. So it said that when he went back home, he began fasting and praying that, you know, that God just give an earthquake. You know, nobody get har- harmed, of course, but just, you know, maybe an earthquake to reveal some of this stuff. And I remember reading it was like the next year, that next summer when they were investigating the uh, the Red Sea crossing, that an earthquake had happened and that, that made a lot of that... Uh, edge and stuff fall away to where you can actually see the slopes of uh of the ship that was pretty wild um yeah so he was definitely a man of faith i remember when we met him well i met him the first time we had like a potluck lunch before the meeting um and just you know it's kind of as a kid i was a teenager at that time just listening to him and if you um, don't care back up and tell people how you first got in contact with him that's a good story Ah, uh, yeah. Um, well, so when when I first met him, though, I, I hear him talk. All he could, all he cared about was the Bible and archaeology, and you know, things something that could save souls. Um, and he, people would bring up like the latest sports scores or politics, and he would never jump in those conversations. You know, I'm just you know just watching him. But as soon as you mentioned something about Noah's Ark or something from the Bible, he would pipe up, and you know, get involved in the conversation. And um, he definitely was a man of faith. Uh, I don't put him on a pedestal, but at the same time, God used him because there's no way that um, someone could go around and, for example, like Mount Sinai. How could you go there in one day to the right location? If you've been there, there's all these valleys and plains around, and this is before Google Earth. So how can you get over there? And suddenly you meet a Bedouin who says, Hena Jebel Musa, or in the Arabic, you know, this is the mountain of Moses. I, how did he end up at that site? And then one day they had to leave. You know, obviously God was guiding him. Um, and so, uh, the same with Noah's Ark. You know, he prayed. Uh, we met one man from the village of Uzengeli, which is right above the Ark site, this little Kurdish village. And he said his mother remembers that earthquake. And it was, he said, it's correct. No one died in the village. Um, but yes, you can see from the before and after photographs that that earthquake did um, drop more of the soil away from the sides of this boat formation and exposed more of the, you could say the outer rim, you know, the ribs or whatever you want to call it, of this boat formation. Um, if you compare the photos from 1961 to uh, 1959 till uh, the 1970s and 80s, you'll see that's a big difference in the soil going right up to the edge of this boat formation and then dropping away after the 79 earthquake. Um, so yeah, um, in regards to how I met Ron, um, well, so uh, as I mentioned briefly, I think before, um, he had come out to Sacramento, uh, this was like 1990 or 91. And so I was in middle school, seventh or eighth grade, and I was a nerd. So I, I always focused on my homework, but, uh, I saw the news, uh, someone had a flyer saying this guy's coming out on a Thursday night. So it was a school night for me. And he was going to give a presentation about Noah's Ark and about Sinai and the Red Sea crossing, et cetera. And, uh, I asked my dad, I said, can you go hear what this guy has to say? Because I want to focus on my homework. Uh, so my dad went and he came back and said, hey, this one guy said he's found everything. <laughs> and so I was like, oh, well, I'm interested. <laughs> what does he have to say? So I looked him up and I found out he had a book. And it was a small little booklet. It's called Discover Noah's Ark, I believe. And it had the art, a, artwork on that thing was, was amazing. It was like very, yeah, you know. The second edition had it like with his Indiana Jones had had these animals drawn across the bottom it was a colored cover he had a, an edition before that it was a black and white one but anyways it was a you know nice booklet uh very small though so i i thought i need to call this guy because i want more details of what the booklet had um and back then this was before the internet so in the early 90s so you can't email somebody or google him or whatever so i decided to call the operator I didn't tell my parents I'm making all these long distance phone calls. <laughs> they found out later when they, they saw the me, the, they got the bill at the end of the month. And they're like, who are you calling in Tennessee? <laughs> I mean, I was talking to him for hours at a time once I got a hold of him. And poor guy, him and his wife. <laughs> but anyways, I remember uh, asking him all these questions about, because, you know, he, he talked about Sodom and Gomorrah, the Red Sea crossing and Mount Sinai and, of course, Noah's Ark. And so I just talked to him on the phone a lot, as much as he, 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 he was available. Um, and then uh, in 95 and 96, he came out to Sacramento. I helped arrange for him to come out. That's when I met him for the first time. We had these public meetings there over a weekend. Um, and I met some of his friends who knew him longer than I did. 
and so I started to get to know them. And I even, you know, I used to talk to David Fazold a lot, like for hours, and he was from Southern California. So um, he, he was a friendly guy, so he answered all my questions and gave his perspective on Noah's Ark because he helped research the Ark site with Ron from 85 onward. Um, and then he also went uh, with Ron on a, a Ron's second trip to Mount Sinai. So he saw the mountain there on uh, that one time. Um, so I, then I also, you know, wrote letters and, and later on emailed the critics. You know, I really wanted to understand this. Um, and so, that, but that's kind of how I got involved. Uh, and then later, a couple years later, I actually had the funds um, to go out to Turkey. A friend of mine from Florida, Bill Fry, who no longer is with us, but he did uh, go out there and he asked for a travel companion. So he, uh, I forget how we met. But anyways, he contacted me and said, hey, you want to be my travel companion? I said, sure, let's go see Noah's Ark. So we spent a week there, um, or here, where I'm at. And so it was my first trip in 1997, uh, and uh, I knew I had to come back. And so then I came back in 2000, twice. That's when I first met Dr. Sally Brock Tuton, the geologist, was on that 2000 trip. Um, and then it started coming a lot out here until now I, I have a, a, a residency visa to live out here longer than a regular tourist visa. Now he mentioned too, um, what was it, the name of that, there was a name of a town that was close to the base that was uh, translated in English to uh, the, the Land of the Eight. Well, okay, so the, uh, the site we're investigating, the boat formation, is right below this town or village called Uzengeli. That's the Turkish name. The Kurdish name is Mashar, uh, which means doomsday. And so the, the mountain there is called Doomsday Mountain, uh, you know. Mount Mashar. Um, but if you go about 20 miles to the west of there, on the other side of the town I'm living in, of Dobizet, just outside of, um, of this town, which has all the hotels and everything, on the west side of this town is another village called um, Arzap. Now, in some literature, they call it Kazan, but it's actually um, the, uh, the Kurdish name is Arzap. And I don't know what that name means. Uh, but if you look on Google Maps, it's called Saglaksuyu, which means healthy water. And it's a valley, it's a really beautiful valley, and it has these uh, springs coming out, and it's iron-rich springs. So you have this red residue on the rocks around, a lot of water coming out, um, and so the people will bottle it and drink it, and they say it's healthy for you. Uh, but it was in that valley that Ron found these huge stones with holes in them, and also a couple, uh, an old house, um, a lot of... Um, uh, carvings and uh, petroglyphs in that area, uh, a lot of ruins there today. Uh, and so you have from, in fact, we brought a Turkish archaeologist out there. And then last year, a Turkish university started excavating the area. But you have this um, history going way back from the time of the Uartu kingdom um, all the way till the day. So you have the you know, Armenian time period up to the local, you know, more modern Ottoman Empire and the the time period, but you have a lot of people focused in on that valley, and the reason is because it's the largest water source in the region. Uh, so you look at ancient maps, you will see that the town of Bayezid, which is Do Bayezid today, where I'm at, that's the kind of the capital of the of the district. Um, and then outside on those ancient maps, you have this town labeled Arzap, and so and right now it's just a little village, like hardly hardly anyone's there. The biggest buildings. Um, this is like this cow, this dairy farm. Uh, but the reason why it's on these ancient maps from like 100, 200 years ago is because it was a very important site and it's because of the water source. So if you theorize that, you know, Noah, when he left the ark, he probably migrated down in these valleys we're at now. But the best place to live, this, this really beautiful green valley, is that area of Arzap. And when Ron first went there in 77 with his two kids, um, the locals did tell him that it was also called um, the Valley of Eight or uh, the Village of Eight. And so, of course, you know, from biblical account that you know, there were eight survivors of the flood, eight people on the ark. And so there's that connection there with the name. And uh, the one thing that people have to realize is that the locals here, um, uh, like the traditions of some of the names go further back to, than what they know, what they have knowledge of. Because, you know, over 100 years ago, um, right after the world, you know, world War I, the Ottoman Empire split up. And so you had a lot of people being displaced and moved around. And in this area, you have some of the original people living here um, no longer here. And so the, the old names and the traditions and stories are, are gone. And so we have some remnants, but again, the people living here today, they might not know why it's called this. Are you a member of the Prometheus Lens Podcast members only group? 
And if not, what are you waiting for? Come join the band of brothers on the hero's journey. With this members only package, you get early access to episodes. You get special episodes that nobody else gets, special video content, documentaries. And you help support the show and keep the lights on. You know, doing podcasts, they can be very expensive. A lot of people don't realize all the subscriptions, the website fees, the, the video and audio subscriptions and things like that. So if you enjoy the content, help keep the lights on, help me keep doing what I love to do, and keep bringing you fire each and every week. So, There's lots of, uh, you know, natural you know, resources and minerals and stuff up that way. It's like if you look back into, uh, uh, what is it, uh, letters to the Lord Arata, you know, between this Lord Arata, you know, of Ararat and in um, Merkur, which a lot of people believe is the uh, uh, biblical Nimrod. Have you heard about hmm. that? No, I haven't. Yeah, there's, they found these stone tablets, and it's letter hmm. correspondences between in Merkur and this Lord of Arata. And he is uh, requesting building materials from the Lord of Arata to help him build this great and mighty temple and tower. And and he even said in there that, uh, and it, because of this building, I will make my name great. You know, like it talks about in Genesis. So like, well, well, I was talking to Trey, and Trey was talking about. It. He said, "Yeah." He said, "I firmly believe." He said that in Merkar is Nimrod, and Lord Arata is Noah. He said he's coming to him for help to build this great big temple or tower. He said, one because where he's at, all the natural resources, and two, he said, you know, Noah and that family lineage were known to be great builders. But in that letter, well, he, Lord Arata's like, you yeah. know, what what does this concern me? You know, he just kind of brushes him off and doesn't help him. <laughs> interesting. I haven't heard of that. But what's interesting about this region um, is that if you go just across, the, you know, the international border today was didn't exist back then. So if you go across the international border into Armenia, there's an ancient archaeological site um, called Metsamor. And at that site, it's an ancient metallurgical site where they made different types of metals and alloys and they say pretty advanced and so and that's just right across the border on the north side of mount ararat and so in this region you have people right after the flood doing advanced metallurgical um uh things here you know they had an industry here and in fact some of this uh metal i don't know all the details but we i went there once in 2017 to armenia and went to visit the site and we met the archaeologists it happened to be their last day of their excavation for the season and they showed us this tomb they're excavating with some of the jewelry they found and uh, they, they told me they had found steel at the site um and so it was an advanced metallurgical site just near where Noah's Ark landed um and so armenia has a lot of other ancient history showing like they found the oldest shoe uh, the oldest winery in this region is in georgia and armenia and so you have these countries nearby showing how technology right after the flood from where we're at today has spread out um and then if you speaking of the tower of babel if you look at the account the bible gives it's very brief it just says as they journeyed from the east until they came to a plain called shinar and then, you know that's where the first cities were built including this tower site tower of babel well, if you look where we're at today, and I want to do this someday, but you can drive this route. So back then they obviously walked, but you can drive this route from where we're at and take a, the River Valley system all the way from this region to southern Turkey to the land of Mesopotamia. And so whether you, uh, you know, there's different ideas of where the Tower of Babel is located, but you do have the whole plain of Shinar, the whole Mesopotamian area, starting in southern Turkey, going all the way through Syria to Iraq, to the Persian Gulf. And so the people after the flood, they obviously had no freeways. So you take the easiest route, you'd follow the river valleys, follow yeah, the, the river valleys. Fresh water source, yeah. Fresh water source, you had vegetation, uh, you had a natural like highway, like the wadis in, uh, in the deserts of Arabia, you had this valley system you could just follow. And it leads from the headwaters, for example, of the Murat River, which was one of the main uh, tributaries of the Euphrates. So this river called Murat starts right near here. And it goes from there and, and forms with other rivers to form the mighty Euphrates River, uh, which uh, then exits out into a big plain in Southern Turkey. Uh, and then from there, it keeps going out to the, the, you know, the rest of Mesopotamia. And so it just matches this site as being the starting place uh, where civilization restarted. And so it matches the biblical account. 
Yeah, even like you said, you know, the oldest wineries, you know, they uh, scientists have tested it and everything and seen that it was uh, some of the oldest vineyards in the world, and that's the first thing that Noah was said to have done when he got off the boat. So all this stuff, you know, I mean, like you were talking about, you know, what a coincidence that you find a boat-shaped object here. What a coincidence it's right at the base of Mount Ararat. What a coincidence the oldest vineyards in the world are here, you know. It's just yeah, too crazy. Yeah, it's all a big coincidence. Yeah. Yeah, but, it's just a, yeah. But those right anchor off, so. stones, one thing I thought was really peculiar was the pictures that he had in that book that you were talking about. There's mm -hmm. uh, eight hooked crosses. Yeah. You so know, did the Knights Rod... Templar? find this and, and believed it to be well, the site because i mean that's yeah, what that looks the, like to me it looks like those night templar hooked crosses yeah. well so obviously the crosses were added later um, yes once i put out a video and i had used um it was about ron talking about uh, where noah might have been buried in his house and all that um and it's in this valley valley of, or region of eight you know this uh, saglaxuyu village and so I put the video out, but as the thumbnail for my video, I used one of the standing stones. There's a lot of standing stones in this village um, and had crosses on it. So people started leaving comments saying, oh, you know, this can't be Noah's grave because they had no crosses back in Noah's time. Um, obviously, <laughs> they missed Lord. the whole point. And, yeah, and obviously crosses were added later by Armenian Christians. And so one of the first countries to become, a, in fact, the first country to become a, a Christian con a nation was Armenia. And then they take their history and go way back to, to one of the grandsons of Noah. And so they're just right across the border from where we're at right now. Um, and so this area, they actually had, used to have a lot of Armenians living here. Uh, and so they recognized the biblical account and they would carve uh, different things of eight, like the eight crosses onto these standing stones. Um, and a lot of these standing stones, so Ron found 12, I believe, about a dozen during his lifetime. After he passed away, uh, my friends Zafer and others in this area have found a lot more. I think they found a total of today, 26 or so of these stones. Um, and uh, some have crosses, others do not. So again, it just shows, because some people say, well, the Armenians carved these stones and it's their um, headstone for Armenian graveyards uh, called Tachkars or whatever. Uh, but if you look at those stones, the Armenians will have their holes at the bottom um, of these stones. Um, and it's not like what these stones are. Uh, and, and you find, uh, again, maybe you say half that don't even have crosses and they're out on top of hills and out further out in the fields. They're not a part of like a, an Armenian graveyard. Um, so then the question of what are they? And Ron believed that these were uh, drogue stones, uh, which is a little different from an anchor stone. So a drogue stone are used right, to stabilize the ship. Yeah. yeah, to stabilize the ship in a storm. Uh, and there's a good video we have on our YouTube channel that is, um, um, linked to um, another video by National Geo uh, that they had edited out of their, they did a, a special on this about 10 years ago about Noah's Ark, and they filmed this test where they put these stabilizing stones on this model of Noah's Ark, and it actually stabilized the boat so it wouldn't uh, capsize on all the waves. Uh, and so it's a perfect example of what possibly these stones were. Um, and so, you, yeah, you do have some of them, not all of them, but some of them do have eight crosses on it where the, uh, later on the Armenians came along and associated these standing stones with the biblical story. See, I, I often wondered, because you know how uh, when the Knights Templar formed, they were going and gathering these relics. You know, they were going and trying to gather them all and protect them, you know, or preserve them or, or hoard them for the, you know, the Vatican. But, and you see, I seen those marks and I was like, I wonder if they believed that this was the, the side of Noah's Ark and they just kind of put their stamp on it. But then I even thought yeah. about Josephus. You know, Josephus oh, yeah. talks about, you know, yeah. people journeying up to up to the mountains and taking pieces of the boat, you know, for uh, holy relics and stuff. Well, just like today, you have pilgrims, tourists. You have the same thing, you know, ancient pilgrims and tourists. You know, not as easy to travel back then. No airplanes, it's very difficult and dangerous to do these type of pilgrimages. But Josephus, as you're right, you know, 2,000 years ago, during the time of Christ, he wrote about, uh, and he was quoting other historians who were older, you know, before him, who were talking about the story of Noah and the ark. He said the boat still existed during his time, um, during their time, during his time, and people would come and get these relics. Uh, so again, for me, that's very important, because it shows that after the flood, Noah and his family did not destroy the boat and reuse all the wood to make homes or, you know, a city or whatever. Um, and so, in fact, the, the Bible talks about Noah living in a tent. Um, and, and even today, the traditional homes around here, they use stones and they have a flat roof. 
Um, and so they don't, there's not a lot of trees around here, um, but they, they possibly could have used some of the wood, but from these biblical, or I'm sorry, from the ancient historical accounts, we definitely still had a boat around. So when pilgrims would come thousands of years later, they could take the little pieces of souvenirs and whatever lucky charms and uh, take it with them. And so now here we are 2000 years later after Josephus, and we believe that the decayed remains of Noah's Ark is at the Drupadar site. It's just awesome. Like I said in the beginning, you just, uh, people that are like-minded like me and you, it's just, we read this stuff. And like you talked about Ron, you know, people talking about sports and all this stuff and you're just kind of sitting back, you know, that, that, that I can identify with that. And then when somebody starts talking about something that I believe is important in our biblical history, I'm like, Oh, do you know about the Nephilim giants? Do you know about this? And, then, and sometimes you, yeah, some people, their eyes glaze over yeah. <laughs> others. You'll find someone who's just really into it. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. But Andrew, I, I know you got, uh, a lot of things to do today and i really appreciate your time and come talk to us um if you can Anytime. just give us a plug uh you know uh give us uh, where we can find your work your, you, you mentioned a youtube channel just uh, anywhere anybody can find your stuff if they're more curious yeah well, the best way is on youtube uh, we also have an instagram account but if you look up a uh, discovered uh, d-i-s-c-o-v-e-r-e-d discovered media um, you'll find our YouTube channel. So that's the, there we put up uh, different videos, whether it's of the sites. You know, we do a lot of drone video. We like the aerial views of Noah's Ark and uh, Mount Sinai, the Exodus sites. Uh, so you'll find a lot of our videos there and also links to our uh, website. So we also run DiscoveredSinai.com. Uh, we're, we're investigating uh, Mount Sinai, which is probably just like this site being the real Mount uh, Noah's Ark. We believe the real Mount Sinai is in Saudi Arabia, the land of Midian. And so we've been investigating that for many years and uh, documenting it. And so now we do tours there. Um, but DiscoveredSinai.com is our Sinai site, website. And then for uh, Turkey, we have Noah's Ark Scans.com. Um, and it has, uh, whenever we do updates, we put it out there. And we also have links to our tours, which goes to our tour website for those who want to come out here. Um, and if you're in the region, just uh, send us a message. It doesn't have to be a formal tour. You can just show up and we can take you around and show you the sites, explain what you're looking at and the research that us, that we have done and other people have done. And so, yeah. 